1965, as you all know, we, uh, we first offered disc brakes. They were standard on Corvettes in 1965, and you could, uh, you could have a delete option. And about 300 people, um, wisely or otherwise, chose to have the delete option on their Corvette. Um, we all kind of make fun. People think of the uh, early Corvettes as uh, being less desirable because they have drum brakes, and I really don't feel that way. Uh, the real big advantage that disc brakes offered was fade resistance. So if you're going to be out in competition making repeated high-speed stops, you, got, you want the disc brakes. You know, the reason I'm in the Corvette repair business is because of the disc brakes being introduced on Corvettes. They were the most failure-prone component ever known to man. Uh, years ago, I would, uh, you know, we were always taking our calipers off, disassembling them, and trying to make them work a little bit longer. Uh, this is a picture of a front caliper that's rebuilt. Um, and they, and they look pretty much the same from the outside, but there were a number of changes that uh, occurred. And I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, I think when the, when the system was originally introduced, it was a very robust, very uh, well-designed, conceived system. And uh, the Chevy beam counters proceeded to take money out of them whenever they could. Uh, this is the rear caliper. If you've got a set of brake calipers, you'll find that there's seven individual castings. The only one that's common are the front outers. All the rest of them are unique to that particular corner. I mean, all the inners are unique. So there's a left front, right, right front, left rear, right rear, and then the uh, same thing in the, in the back. Uh, one thing that you'll notice in the rear, probably not too visible here, but the rear calipers had two bleeder screws. Fronts only have one. Okay, why would that be? Well, the, 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 the rear calipers weren't cross ported In other words, you had to bleed both sides of the rear caliper half individually. This is the first time that we ever introduced that, that disc brakes were used on domestic cars, and it was a very unique design. The calipers were fixed. It means it was mounted rigidly on the suspension, and all the pistons floated. You know, our modern cars, most of them have a floating caliper, so you only have one piston that works, and the caliper moves to center the pads on the, on the rotor, wherever it happens to be. The rotor's fixed, right? Um, Here's a picture of a rear caliper that you can almost see, but you see there's the, the cross ports only at the bottom, and the air that would go through the construction holes, they're fed through the bottom of the bores up into the other side, and up into this one here, but there's no way to bleed the air out of this chamber, so, so that's why they have a bleeder on both sides. So when you're bleeding your brake systems, it's necessary to bleed all six bleeder screws. In other words, I, you start out with the longest line first. So you go to your right rear, and you do the outer one and the upright rear inner, left rear outer, left, left rear inner, and then you do the right front and left front, and you get all the air. This is a, a cross section of the first design caliper. And uh, if you'll notice, the, the, the pistons are very unique. The, in 65 and 6, there was actually a guide that rose out of the bottom of the bore that kept the piston from cocking in the bore. And the piston also had a phenolic insulator that's retained with that screw on the front. That was to keep heat that was generated during the braking operations from entering into the, into, the, uh, into the hydraulic system and perhaps boiling it. This is an original piston. You can kind of see the guide on the back of it sticking out and uh, the phenolic insulator on the front. Where these, this, was, this is Delco's. Yes. Delco Marine, right? Yes. Design. What did, did Bendix and, and uh, who's the other one from Bosch, did they have similar designs or different? At that time, yeah, oh, Delco Moraine made everything for the only ones, right? Right, and I'm but, saying that for a particular reason so you know that this was the only one around, there wasn't anything else. And then later on, the competition came into doing it. You know, there's some other calipers that did, uh, you know, that other cars, I mean, the British cars had it, the Germans, yeah. But most of them, what's unique about the Corvette design at this time is that if you look closely, this is the hydraulic seal, okay, this, this little and it's a lip seal. And if you think about it, the, high, the brake fluid be introduced, you know, it comes through these, you know, through that line. That you don't see all of them here, but here's the cross point. But you bring the hydraulic fluid into the back, and it's pushing on the back of that piston. Here's where it's sealed. And out here is a, a dust boot. It's just a shield to keep crud from getting in there. But if you think about it, as the pad would wear, the piston moves forward in the bore. As the piston moves forward in the bore, it, this this seal actually wipes the surface and it moves forward. Now the problem that these cor that the, that the Corvette, came, the, the shortcoming was, is that in this area between the hydraulic seal and the dust boot, there was a piece of cast iron that was exposed to air. And in Michigan, it was usually moist air, humid air. 
And so you would end up getting rust forming in this part of the bore. And when your hydraulic seal moved forward and attempted to seal in that rusty area, guess what happened? Your brakes went away, right? Because your fluid would be disappearing. And so, you know, I get people coming to me all the time, I'm going to buy a new set of calibers and I'll put silicon fluid in and I'll be done with all this problem. <laughs> well, guess what? The silicon fluid, just like the you know, glycol based fluid, is all trapped back here. And this piece of the bore, where it's rusting, is still rusting just the same. It's oblivious to the fact that there's silicone fluid in the back, which is a non hydroscopic. So, there's a lot of people that made a lot of money over the years where we would basically take the bore and they would just take a slight, uh, you know, slight. Uh, overcut and they put a sleeve in there. They put a stainless steel insert in them. And if you look at the stainless steel inserts, they always stop right above this port because they didn't want to drill those cross ports afterwards. So the sleeves only did that part. But that was the important part is because the uh, part of the bore that the seal needed to ride on was happy. And the nice thing about stainless uh, sleeves is not that the, it's not a panacea. It's not the end of your problems forever. You've still got an aluminum piston riding on a stainless bore, which you had this is a, this similar metals, and you'll get a galvanic action, and there's some aluminum oxide that forms, and that eventually gets under the hydraulic seal, and it too will cause a leak. So, um, anyway, uh, Chevrolet had, had saw a way to make some money, and uh, they, they went, came up with another piston, and all the critical dimensions are the same. I don't know if you can see it, but here's the first gen and the second one. And uh, they basically eliminated the phenolic off the front, eliminated the guides as less, less machining operations. They also cheapened the castings. The, the, the early castings were, if you talk to Gib Huffster and the guys that are racing, they always want to find those early generations because I think it's a more magnetic structure in the iron. Very I stiff, very day. rigid. So I'll pass these around and, you know. Uh, and there was a, 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 you know, the heavy duty brakes, they offered uh, the J56 brake package and in the early cars, the uh, phenolic was was adequate, and the later ones they wanted to offer a phenolic piston also. So what they did is, if you can see that, this is a big chunk of phenolic, and this is what was used on your J56 brake packages, starting in 1967 through what 1975 when they finally built the last of them. They see big heavy insulator on the front. The rest of the caliper in internally was the same. Okay, so I'll pass that around also. When your brake pad started to wear more and the piston had to move more and then you had more corrosion and it was faster issues. You know, as, it, as, it, as your distance increases, then all yeah. that rust that's in there. Conventionally, it was all the same. Yeah, you got you know, to the, get the more rust. The, 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 the pad condition determined how far back in the bore the pistons. Yeah. Most of the time when we honed out our, our calipers <laughs> and put them back together and we thought we fixed it, what we really did was we pushed the piston, we put new pads in, we pushed the piston back into the best part of the bore, and it worked for a while. And so every time you got into honing these things, you had a little less life on the next set of pads before it started leaking again. So it was, you know, like I say, a number of us got into the, the uh, caliper repair game shortly thereafter, and uh, it started making a lot of money making, putting sleeves on. Now, an interesting fact about brake pad wear is that if you're running in competition, they get hot, but the most of the hottest surface of the pad is the front and leading edge, okay? And what happens when, when a pad gets hot, that's where it wears. And so eventually, if a, you know, a Corvette's big, heavy car, trying to stop them, you would wear the front and rear edges of the, of the pad down. So the pad would have a big belly in it, right? Well, so when you come into a turn and you got these worn pads on, you stand on the brakes for all they're worth, guess what happens? You spend all your braking effort straightening the pad, flattening the pad out, so your pedal goes to the floor. And the serious racers, guys like Greenwood and stuff like that, if you look at some of their cars, they had a, a window right above the master cylinder, so they could go in there and you would apply a vacuum to the top of the master cylinder, suck the fluid back out of the calipers, and you could drop new pads in them during the races. <laughs> okay, so Anyway, Chevrolet decided, well, you know, we could help this situation out. And the standard pads, they were retained. You can't see it on here, but that's a pin. And it's had a, you know, just a single pin in the top. Well, the heavy-duty pads, they thought, we're going to stiffen this up. So if you look at the backing plate on this, it's got a flange on it, okay? 
So like this pad would be very, very difficult to bend in this direction, okay, to, to make a banana out of it. So the heavy duty calipers, they cut the ear off that retains that pin, put these, they were uh, Inconel lining aircraft age, very expensive. I mean, in 1969, I think these were like 260 bucks, is what they cost for them. I bought my first one that. And uh, so I've got a set of these Inconel linings here. They're, you know, they're, anyway, there's, these are really pretty simple. And there's a lot of J tools that Kent Moore offered, which you don't need any of them if you want to get into this. Um, but they had, but basically the tool was that they would, what's important is when you take these calipers apart, you get them clean. And you clean them with brake cleaner, okay? You don't go in there with uh, gasoline. You don't go in there with uh, lacquer thinner and stuff like that because that's really bad shit because it swells up seals and you'll have no brake. But what you can do is you can take those pistons that, you're being, that are being passed around and you put the hydraulic seal on. I mean, in one special tool, and, I, I, and the, the special tool is the worst screwdriver in your entire collection. <laughs> you take that one and you filed all the burrs off the blade, a flat bladed screwdriver, Feed it to your wire wheel for a while so you make it just blunt, so it's like a tongue depressor, only smaller. <laughs> and with that, after you clean this thing out, wash it all out, you can clean them up with Scotch Bright or something like that, or Dingleberry Hone if you got lots of money. But you clean the bore out, blow them all out, and then you coat everything with lubricant. And being that I'm too cheap to buy just brake lubricant, I use brake fluid. Whether it's silicone or regular, just by lube the bores generously with brake fluid, and I apply it to the seals, and you put the stuff on the seals before you put it on the piston because it acts like a lubricant. So the seal will flop onto the piston, go into the groove, orient itself right. Really important that you orient the, 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 the lip seal correctly. I mean, the, if you look at the one piston, it's got a seal on it. You want it, the, the seal's shaped kind of like a V. So you always want to make sure that the hydraulic fluid is introduced to the backside of the V, which makes it open up and seal. The other way, it acts like a check valve. You, if you can imagine, you pull out that way, it just closes the seal up and it leaks like a sieve. So anyway. You put your seals and you boot everything on the piston. Put the spring in the bore and introduce it to the piston down there and kind of cock it so you get half the lip in there. And with your dull, blunted screwdriver, you can push the rest of the hydraulic seal in the bore. You do this very carefully. You want to make sure your bore is clean, no nicks in it like that. And then push it down the rest of the way and the hydraulic seal, you just got to tap that in. They've got all kinds of special drivers and stuff. I do it with a small hammer, it's a small ball peen hammer, put it all together. It's fine. And I know people that are in the business rebuilding, they all do it the way I, none of them have the sleeve that you use to push them down in the special drivers. It works pretty simple. So you just got to keep the bores clean. If you've got silicone, I mean silicone, stainless sleeve calipers, you should be good for life with those. You know, not free of trouble, but you should never have to replace your calipers. You clean them, take them apart, clean them up. The good news is, is that the corrosion won't pit the bore. That's the nice thing about a, a stainless sleeved caliper. You can clean them up, put new hydraulic seals in, and you're off and running again. Okay, okay this is the piston, the second gen. Here's this, this is what you get to rebuild a, a front caliper. It would be uh, four seals and four vestments and two O-rings. The rears, the difference would be only one O-ring because you only cross. That was a, my effort to show you what a lip seal looks like, but well, it failed miserably. Here's a piston with the seal and the, and the, and the lip seal on it. Again, you know, the lip is going to be, yeah, we can't, uh, the photographer. Really important thing. I get a lot of cars coming into my shop that have had <coughs> been to everywhere under the sun. They keep losing their brakes. They, 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 their brakes work for a while, and as soon as they drive it, their brakes go away. And uh, I had one car that's 6,000 miles on a pace car. And I had been to a dealership for a, deal, for a, a brake job, and they did a wonderful job, turned all the rotors, put, replaced all the calipers, and, every you know, few hundred miles, he'd have a spongy pebble again. Well, what they had done is, unfortunately, they had drilled out the rivets and taken the rear rotors off and put them on their Amco bench lathe and turned them. And we put them back on the car, and all of a sudden, we had a rotor that wasn't running perpendicular to the axis of the spin. In other words, it looked like a potato chip to the caliper. And if this rotor is wobbling around on there, as little as five thousandths, okay, like two hair thicknesses, total indicator reading. If it's moving around that much, you can start pumping air into your brakes. Those lip seals, they work really good in one direction. They're designed to work to hold the hydraulic fluid in. But if you're going to put pressure on the other side, it'll introduce whatever. So air gets in there and your pedals go away. So we get a lot of work, and people think I'm a genius, because I tell them, 
the rotors are the problem. And they've already replaced the master cylinder, they've replaced the calipers, they've replaced safety valves, proportioning valves, everything under the sun has been changed repeatedly. And I tell them your rotor's the problem. So if you got that situation, I mean, I don't recommend ever taking the rivets out. All your cars came with the, rivet, the rotors riveted in the front hubs, same thing in the back. Leave them together. Yeah, Jeff? What's your opinion of using the pistons to place with O-ring design pistons? That solves that problem, actually. But what are your, what's your opinion? You know, some O-rings have been around longer than dirt, okay? And I, I believe that the people at Delco Moraine weren't stupid. And an O-ring piston will work just fine, but it has no desire to retract. And the other ones, when they, re, you know, they relax, I think the piston, I talked to John Hinckley about it too, I said, and this is what got me, I was, was going to write an article about this brake design, because I read some hogwash in one of our recent publications from some guy about touting O-ring calipers, and I'm thinking, they're no less prone to corrode. If it's sitting on dirt, it'll, it'll leak. And it has, the, 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 the problem is that it won't come back. It'll cost you fuel economy. And believe me, they could have put O-rings in it back in 1965. Why didn't they do it? And I'm, and I'm not sure what all the reasons were, but I think that's one of them. So no, I'm not, I, do I, no, I don't buy them, don't recommend them. Don't be bashful about that article. <coughs> huh? Don't be bashful about that article. Okay. So anyway, what you want to do is put your dial indicator on your rotors if you've got a problem with, uh, it's not pulsation, it's, a, it's an air problem. You know, as you drive it, the problem will only manifest itself if you drive your car. And, and eventually, the more you drive it, the more air will beat into your, into your calipers. The more run out you got, the quicker it will happen. The greater the clearance between the piston and the bore, you know, some of the calipers that are being remachined out there, they're lucky to hold the bore suck, the clearance within five thousandths. I mean, the ones that are really right on the money, they're going to be less prone to suck here. But in, indicate them, I and if they're over five thousandths, you got two choices. One is that, you know, you got to take them out, have them, take them, have them return. The rear ones, which are mounted to the, to the spindles, you got to do them on an on-car lathe. And there's a couple of companies that make on-car lathes. You got to use a hub-mounted lathe. I'll, I'll talk to you about that if anybody's interested in that level of detail. But you can drill them on car. Where the rivets? You're saying don't drill those rivets out. Why? Is that because they were press fitted when they were done? So you know the dimensions are correct. Okay, the parts were um, all <coughs> assembled first and machined later, and so. You could have a hub or a spindle and then a rotor assembled to it, and the pieces may not have been perfect, but like the rear spindles, they had machining centers in them, like a little conical depression, and all the finishing operations were done on those machine centers. So they ground all the bearing diameters, all the seal diameters, ground all the friction surfaces, and when they're done with this assembly, we're assured that the friction surfaces of the rotor are dead nuts perpendicular to the axis of the spindle, and that's what you want. And when you disassemble it and do it, then you screw it all up. When you take them apart, you risk being having a speck of rust. And if you get a speck of rust, you know, 3,000, put a hair between there and clamp it back together, well, guess what? You're out of tolerance on the outside of the rotor. So these are very precision parts, believe it or not, as crude and clunky as they are. So, uh, you know, you want to keep that run out to a minimum. And so, I, you know, don't go looking for trouble. Don't, I don't separate them. Heavy duty brake package, when we talked a little bit about the pads, they also had stiffening, stiffeners on the front. Um, they kept the uh, calipers in place better. They were heavy forging that looked like this. And these went on the steering knuckle and actually supported the caliper support brackets. So, and they also, early on, had a, a um, well, you see the, yeah, you can see the flange on the, on the pad. This is rear pads on the J56 in the front. The, the rear pads, they didn't use dual pin pads on the back of the, of the, of the uh, J56 brake. They're all single pins. Uh, probably because they didn't need to. If you think about it, the rear pistons were 1 3 8 diameter, the fronts were 1 and 7 8, so that the cross sectional area is half. So you get half the braking power in the back that you did on the front. And so the rear pads didn't give you as much trouble as the fronts because racing, you're getting all the, all the stopping powers in the front. And indeed, on most of the race cars, it was even more exacerbated. They would put pressure reducing valves, which I can show you got some pictures of that, that would lower the pressure even further through the rears because the fronts were doing at least three quarters of the braking on those cars. There's some caliper support brackets. Unfortunately, these are all the 68 newer ones. The early ones, for you judging crazies, uh, um, had the, the, the casting numbers were bodily. They stuck up, so it's easy to pick them out from the, from the later designs where the numbers are stamped into the caliper support bracket. Next. 
That's a pressure reducing valve. They were used until through 68, 69, they didn't use them anymore. I don't know why. They have a special bracket that they, 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 but, uh, that mounted them underneath the master cylinder in 65, 6, and 7. 68, it went down to the frame. And you can see here, uh, I'm not sure if that says master, you know, one says R and M, although the R is the reduced pressure that goes to the back, and I think the M goes to the master cylinder. And here's the, uh, uh, the pressure reducing valve mounted to a, a, uh, a bracket that, you know, should be on that car, but didn't make it. Okay, I think that covers most of what I want to talk about, about brake service and in general, so hopefully you'll go home and I can see why you were saying that the drum brakes were not all that bad. You know, I, I tell people, I don't want to buy a 63 or 4, I said, why not? And they say, well, you've got drum brakes. I said, what's wrong with that? Yeah. Well, I said, they, they stopped just as good once. <laughs> yeah. So as long as you're not in competition where you got to, oh, and if, and if you want to do repeated high speed stuff, put metallic linings on, they'll stop just as good. Yeah. Well, thanks for your attention and uh, thanks,